Hello! Today I'm going to be discussing um, a more advanced topic that you can incorporate into your game, um, specifically the idea of probing moves, or sometimes we call them asking moves. Asking moves are a way of getting some more information about your opponent's strategy before continuing on with your own. So I'm going to go through one of the most common and probing moves, um, one the first one that I ever learned, and it's also a sort of invasion, and it's specifically an invasion against this shape of a knight's move enclosure from the 3-4 stone. It's one of the tightest enclosures there is, so it's not really an invadable enclosure, especially not directly invadable, but there are ways that we can um, strike at it. Now, Normally when something is low and very strong, we can cap it from above in which our opponent can play in one of two ways. They can play a defensive move on this side or they can play a shoulder hit on this side. Or we can shoulder hit this structure in which our opponent can play like this and occasionally they might play like this. Now, um, both of these are standard reductions, but today I'm actually going to be discussing a different move. This, what I'll call, um, it's almost the underside attachment. So this is a second line attachment under an enclosure. Now this type of attachment is not necessarily um, the best move always, but sometimes it can be very useful. Here it is useful. The idea is that black is already strong on this structure, so it is okay to touch this structure. Um, we would not want to touch the other parts of this structure that are weaker, such as this stone or this stone. The wing stones, eventually we would want to make an invasion nearby. And then those two stones could be attacked in the future. Or we can make an invasion and attack this stone. Now right now it's not the right move because we'll just get kind of a, a needless heavy group without a base. So let's go and look at this right now. So there are a number of responses. White is going to respond locally. White's, I mean, black is going to respond locally. Um, we'll start with the easiest one. When black simply extends out, it gives white very little room um, to move out, so white can go ahead and try to make a base in the corner. Now, this is the very simplest of all variations. And this is the smallest type of life um, generally available. I've heard this called the mouse face. Um, so if you can think this is the mouse face, it's alive. Um, it already has two eyes because black cannot take away the two eyes here because then we have an eye here. Now, of course, if black plays like this, we have to make our life directly, but black's not going to play that immediately, but perhaps in the end game. So, the problem with white playing this sequence is that it's a very small life, and it does not take a very large chunk of territory, and it's still black's move. So, when it's still black's move, black can really play anywhere on the board. Um, can play a number of moves, can look to reduce white, can ex extend the um, structures here. Likely here. So, in this type of case, black is happy that white has taken the life. So normally, the reason we call this a probing move is that 
When black plays like this, black says, you know what, I'm going to let you live in the corner, but it's going to be small and you're going to have to lose the initiative. So when it's like that, white can go ahead and then switch strategies and come back to this later. For example, let's say that um, black uh, goes ahead and has turned his face towards other areas of the board and another middle game sequence develops later when it's convenient for white to take away the territory and white has sufficiently reduced the middle of the board and secured his stones there white can play at eight and then make the life there so when black plays this normally white does not continue immediately for life now sometimes if white wants to white can make one more push and if black pushes at a now white can live and then the turn at s6 is not sente against the corner so in this way white can take a bigger chunk and then black has to leave the s6 area open and then black can take sente, so white can take a little bit of a bigger corner by making one more push. However, if black then blocks the corner, white has to have enough room to go ahead and make life on the outside. So sometimes this can, you know, become a place that white can get attacked. So in this way, white can try to move out, but it's a little bit heavy. But it's okay because the black three stones on the right side um, don't yet have a base. And white's running through black's potential framework, so it can be possible. But if black is thicker on the right or the center, it can be painful to make this push here because you'll get the corner shut down and have to live on the outside. So that covers this R5 move. The other move that's really common is the simple Hane on the outside and when it's Hane on the outside we'll learn one of the very first Sabaki techniques. Sabaki is the art of making shape um, with some finesse in your opponent's territory. So a common Sabaki technique is to make a probing move and if your opponent is playing very severe like Hane in this fashion we cross cut. We cross cut with the idea of sacrificing the second line stone. So if black plays this, white's allowed to play the sequence now white has made three forcing moves onto black and then can go ahead and leap out. Now, when we leap out like this, the idea is a lot of Q players might think, well, what if I just leave all these cutting points? Isn't this bad? No, it's not that bad because even if black decides to keep eating all these stones, he's eating just a few stones at a time. So making two to four points at a time eating those stones but white is getting fairly thick. Now this white group, even though you don't see the immediate thickness, it's kind of very hard to attack this shape. It almost has two eyes already because it has the Atari at Q6 and the Atari at S8 and it's out. And now the F3 and J4 stones um, can be pressured and attacked. Um, white can more successfully invade the bottom White can also grab control of the center. So this is um, a totally fine way. So white shouldn't be scared of these cutting points. If white is scared of the cutting points and plays something very tight like this, then suddenly he's left with a very heavy group. So these stones don't have a really definite eye shape, and now they're kind of clumpy. So 
when we're making sabaki, two things. One is we can sacrifice stones and get what's called kikashi, forcing moves. These three are kikashi. Now sometimes when you have that much kikashi, you can go ahead and just play elsewhere entirely on the board, knowing that you'll be able to use these stones flexibly and light. Not like that. Um, sorry. Like this. So that's one variation for when black grabs the single stone there. Now, when black grabs in this way, he's trying to prevent that kikashi. So this is OK, because you have to have sufficient room on the right side. But when you do this, black can take a bigger corner, but white's perfectly satisfied with this. This is using the forcing moves very effectively. White has a pretty resilient group, and the R10 stone has been separated out of the framework. And importantly, when making sabaki, we want to try to help our opponent as little as possible. So we haven't forced our opponent to defend the bottom side. So black has just solidified a corner that was already black's corner. And that corner is only you know, 15 to 18 points at the moment, the biggest. 6, 8, 10, 12, you know, 15 points. Um, now sometimes, so white can wrap around at B. Sometimes white can also extend here. I mean, this is also a way of playing, which is, is fine in this case. But um, normally we play this way when R10 is not there. So extending at A is better if there's no blocking stone right there. So turning at B is a better way of making shape when there is a stone at R10, and you don't want to just keep pushing along that third line. This way can be very severe if black has the ladder. So if black has the ladder, this is the ladder I'm referring to, it can be very severe to play like this because black can come out of the ladder and there's not much white can do. If white plays like this, even with the ladder, can be, um, hmm. you know, so again, we're assuming that so you can see how it would be difficult for white if black had a ladder here. Now, fortunately for white, this ladder leads to here. So the ladder works for white in this case. So black can't quite play this move. Playing this move is an overplay if black doesn't have the ladder. The last move to really consider is this. Now in this type of move, black has to have a lot of central power to actually make this work, because this is going to allow his corner to suffer. But he would have to be able to attack the four stones effectively. But in this game, just the attack really isn't there. The, the stones can settle happily, and white's kind of able to just push through and make a group on the side of the board um, I don't think that white would be dissatisfied if this happened. So black would really have to have a lot of extra strength here. Um, maybe if black had some additional stones on the bottom side, black could play very severe. But in, in this current game, there's just too much trouble for black. Black can't play this severe. He'll get those two stones attacked. So 
If black has a lot of strength along the bottom and in the center, he can play this very severe move to try to keep white from having anything. But in this cut, in this game, really, the only logical moves are A and B. C and D, C is if you have the ladder, and A, uh, sorry, and D is if there's really just overwhelming local power for black to mount a large scale attack and make white heavy. Otherwise, it incurs too much damage into the corner and the side. So that's the main variations. Everything else um, is pretty simple. Um, C, D, and E are all moves that, if black is not overwhelmingly strong, it should be pretty easy for white to just play lightly. For example, the C move can be um, white can kind of play here and threaten to make some life in the corner or play here this can be a a very light way of making shape white has the cove for shape and can still get out So in in all of these variations, C, D, and E, black's trying to give white very little options to make moves. In these ways, white can still... White can't quite live in this way yet. Sorry. So white can live in this way though. Maybe one more push in than that. It's a bigger corner. Black takes the outside. So white might not when black does this, white might want to go ahead and play here. So white has made an invasion and white can still play a move at A and Sente. So the point of something like this move here is to force um, white to kind of um, play lighter and not play more directly in that way. So white will move on with other things. And white can move on completely elsewhere on the board and maybe come back to it later. But most likely white's going to move out into the side. White can move into the side. Black can take control of that stone. Then white can start a run out here with the two black stones. And white still has some resources at S6. So white's fine with this. If black is very thick already in the center of the board, then this can be a, a severe way because white can be very severely attacked here. It's very difficult for white to settle. So a move like this is more useful if black already has strength on the right side and in the center that's more significant. Kind of the same with this move. And even the same with this move. Of course, white can do this, and if black does this, it reverts. Oh, wrong order. It reverts to this position, which we've already gone over. And if like this, then white can kind of try to play lightly in the area. So moves at C, D, and E are more effective for black if he really wants to prevent white from making immediate shape in the area. So when we play like this, we're often asking black a question, and black has five responses. And then we play accordingly to those responses. So 
to recap, this says you can have the corner. I'm going to stay solid on the outside. So white can go about reducing the outside or invading the bottom or just playing elsewhere entirely on the board if there's something more important in the particular game that you're playing. And then come back for the corner later. This might seem severe, so white makes sabaki quickly. And if this, white can kind of locally ignore it and start moving out along the side and making other plans. Coming back to the S4 stone later, or if black grabs hold of the S4 stone, using it for forcing moves. similar to this, can leave the S4 stone for later, use it for forcing moves, so on. So I hope that covers the, the very basics of what an asking move can look like, how we can attach for Aji. Aji is kind of lingering potential. And it gives us some ideas on what to do if we're faced with this move. All right, I hope that's useful, and I'll see you around.